Hello guys, welcome to Red Dog Bushcraft. I'm Tim Langston and today we're going to do a review after a seasons of use of this Blind Horse Pathfinder Scout Knife. We'll process a little bit of wood and do some carving tasks and I'll let you know what I think about this knife especially since I've been using it for a while now but we'll do a little bit of demonstrations. So stick with me, I'll bring the camera in closer and we'll get to it. Well, one of the first things everybody wants to know about a knife, if you put it in the category of a survival knife or a one-tool option, is how does it baton? And I'm going to tell you right now, guys, I'm not a big baton guy. But this knife will baton, and it'll cut right straight through. Now, I don't do a lot of batoning because I believe in carrying an axe. But... I need to know if this knife's going to be able to baton in case I have to count on it if I think that this is going to be my one tool option. I think uh, Morris Kohansky, uh, a survival instructor, I respect a lot and I encourage you to look him up on the internet. Uh, he says it best, your survival knife is going to be the one that you have on your side. But with that said, what I usually do is I'll take these knives when I first get them and I'll baton with them and I'll strike a ferrule rod with them. I'll do a little bit of carving with them. I'll even sharpen and buff them up a little bit. But after that, I try to use the knife for its intended purpose. So I don't do a whole lot of chopping down trees with my knife just to go out and see how hard I can abuse it. Once I get that fine cutting edge on it, I like to see how long I can keep that on there and how long it stands up to the punishments that I put it through. This knife was purchased to be my large butcher knife for processing game out in the field. And it does that extremely well. It is large. It's about as large as I would want for a white-tailed deer. If you're going for some larger game animals, uh, I think it would be fine but I can't imagine needing a knife any larger than this. As a matter of fact, uh, I skint deer with it just to see how it performed and it held up fine. But it is not the knife that I would want to use every day for skinning. I like a much smaller knife for that particular task. But once again, you know, that's all up to uh, the individual and what they plan on using their knife for. But this knife handles very well. Because of the generous handle, it allows you, when you're doing a reduction of your material, to get that point in and dig and pry just because you've got so much material. Get your hand up on the end of it and get a good firm grip. That allows for a safer operation, but yet, the handle, and I don't have the largest hands in the world, but there's plenty of room for me to choke up on that thing if I want to. This is not the position that I normally cut. Um, I don't like my finger up here on the back of the spine of the knife. I don't think it's as strong as a grip. I prefer to use this thumb and do my push cuts and then come back in and cut away that extra material. Uh, one of the other things that uh, people like to see is uh, will that knife feather? Well, sure it will. It does a really nice job of them. And you can get into some really fine stuff, especially if you follow those lines. But we'll get into a little bit more of that when we start working with the fat wood. Now, I said that I don't like to baton a whole lot, and uh, that is true. But one of the areas that I would baton is when I'm preparing my fat wood for a fire. But that's usually with smaller pieces of wood. And I think before we carve on this stick anymore, and this video gets too long with my ramblings, I'll go ahead and do a little bit of that. So I've laid out several pieces of fat wood that I think the grain is pretty consistent 
amongst the, the group of them there because I've got several knives I'd like to review this week and I'm trying to keep it um, as consistent as I can. So the work area here is going to be the same. I'm going to use the same baton. I'm going to try to wear the same gloves and all of that type of stuff. But with that said, it's pretty cold out here today, so I'm dressed pretty warm. Now, when it comes to shaving fat wood, if you want to catch it with a ferrule rod, you know you have to get some right fine shaving. So if you're using the blade, uh, you can certainly do that. That's uh, about as fine as you're going to see and be able to consider it a curl. And we can take those in and make several curls, especially by changing the blade angle. how far up we go, the angle that we want the curls to go. If you keep your tip down, they're going to roll this way. If you were to keep your tip more in the upper, pointed up like that, you can see it rolls away from you. But there you go. We can do feather sticks, make a bunch of those. The other thing is how well does it scrape? Now, every knife you can take the sharpened edge and you can sit there and you can scrape off some shavings like that. That's cool, it works. But that's not what I like to do. That 90 degree spine that's on the back that I'm gonna to use to throw sparks, that's what I want to be able to do my scraping with. I wanna save that material and that cutting edge to keep it from dulling. And there's two ways you can do that. You can either hold it in your hand, your knife with your hand down firm and pull that fat wood back, or you should be able to sit that fat wood down, stick that down into a solid base and scrape that knife, controlling where that fat wood goes. See the way that knife's at a little bit of an angle so it's trapping it, the wind's blowing out here pretty good. And I'm able to retain quite a bit of that pile right there. Let me scrape down a little bit of this, not a whole lot. And then I want to take my ferrule rod and see if we can strike that. So let me get my ferrule rod because I want to use the same ferrule rod with each demonstration. And I'll be right back and we'll see if we can scrape enough and get a good hot spark. Okay, I ran and got the ferrule rod that I want to use for each knife demo. And uh, I got those scrapings piled up there. So we'll scrape our ferrule rod, get it clean holding their knife firm see if we can throw enough sparks down there and we did to get that little bit of fat wood burning so that's important to me is having that spine so that not only can I create that dust that I need but also to strike a good hot uh, spark so how do you tell if you're removing enough material what I like to do <laughs> and if it won't do this I adjust something I like to take that from a kneeling position, hold that knife good and firm off the edge of a stump or something, a, a little less than knee high or knee high, and pull that thing back. And if I don't have burning material when it hits the ground, I know I need to do something to the back of that knife because it's been my experience that most of these ferrocium rods are the same. But there is definitely a lot of variance in your different objects that you can use to strike with and I keep strikers and I like the backs of saws and all of that but I believe that your knife should be able to do exactly what you just saw and throw those good sparks now as far as other related carving tasks um, you know I could sit here and carve out a tri stick I guess but it would just eat up a lot of video time but the biggest thing to know is this is a big knife um, it's harder to do small, finer tasks, but if you're talking about doing uh, a tent stake or if you wanted to baton out a, uh, a uh, pot, one of the uh, pot hanger notches, uh, you can certainly do that. It's uh, small enough that 
you can still perform those tasks. So we'll do that right quick. And see if we can't slip that right underneath there. Kind of carve and break that side right there out. That tip in there. Just like that. And note, I've got everything set up that if I slip, I'm not going to cut myself. My hands are well out of the way. This is not a knife safety class, but of course it never hurts to say when you're trying these things out, try to do it safely. All right, and then we'll just go ahead and eat some of that material out underneath that point and just start cleaning that up a little bit. And in not too long at all, we've got a pot hook. One more cut in there. Let's break that out. And one more cut. A little bit of an angle up in there. I like mine situated to where it actually comes to a point towards this top. So not only is it tapered up like this, but there's actually a little place for the bell to hang. So I like to clean that out. It only takes one or two more little small cuts. And this is actually a lot easier. I'm doing it the hard way, I'm trying to be kind of dramatic about the size of the blade, but it really is much easier than I'm making it out to be. If you get in there with your thumb, do a couple of push cuts, get a good firm face like that, and then cut that point down. And that's awesome, you got you a nice pot hook. But anyway, the knife works, it really does. It's as big, is I think I would want to carry as a hunting knife or a one tool option. But the quality, the workmanship, uh, everything that goes into this knife, the way it grips, I have no issues at all. Uh, I did take the knife and just because it's the angle that I sharpen all of my knives with, unless they're a scandy grind, I use a 25 degree angle down at my cutting edge and that's what I sharpen, hone, and strop to. And it's just what works for me. I don't recommend that for you. you. You find out what works best for you and you stick with it. But that's the only thing that I did to this knife. But I do that to all of my knives that are not Scandi grind. Uh, except for fillet knives, of course. And, uh, well, I shouldn't say all my knives because there are several knives that I don't. But most of my hunting knives, um, I go back and I reprofile them with that particular angle. Now, if you're looking for beauty, this knife is going to uh, start to darken out. You can tell this one is getting awfully black and mottled, and you can see the little lines of where it's been scratched and that type of thing. But that's because I've really used it hard this year during hunting season. I've processed six deer with this knife, and I've also used it for a lot of my uh, camp tasks just to see how it performed to find out if that's what I wanted to carry instead of my uh, PLSK-1 or some of the other survival knives that I have, what I consider a survival knife, which is the knife that I use when I'm camping and hiking that if I got in a situation, that's the knife I would have on me. I feel very confident carrying this one, and I hope this review was helpful to you. And until next time, I'm Tim Langston with Red Dog Bushcraft. God bless.